So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, in our uh, never-ending Lotus Sutra class today, I keep saying, well, guys, are, are we done with this? Have you done enough? Should we move on to something else? Oh, no, let's do one more chapter. Just goes on and on and on. Um, there uh, was an interesting statement in there, an interesting concept. I don't know if we closed it, if we addressed it properly, if people, you know, uh, this and that. But basically what that short chapter said was that If you've understood the Lotus Sutra, then therefore you don't need to do a whole variety of things that we've done before. Like you don't need to uh, build temples or feed monks or it just went through a whole list of things. And to me that was very interesting hearing that because uh, we have other people other than me that are willing to talk about it and read it out loud. And what I kept thinking to myself was, so I guess we, and this is all about rebirth. This, this particular chapter talks about having many rebirths and then you're awakened. And then having a lot of rebirths and then you're awakened. And then having a few rebirths and then you're awakened. And uh, but Hai, he really focused on that. He says, so what is this? You know, it's like the countdown to a rocket ship going off. You know, there's 10, and then there's 8, and then there's 7, and there's 6. And, but it just kind of covered all the fields. And as I'm hearing this, I'm thinking, so this is what the practice of Buddhism is about, is rebirths. And uh, so it's really no different than the Hindus. And of course, the Hindus, you know, I have a Hindu doctor who's a wonderful doctor, and we were talking one day, and he says, well, you know, we just reabsorbed Buddhism. It, in India, it's not a separate religion. We just <laughs> sucked it right back into the whole Hindu thing. And I went, yeah, okay, that makes sense. But uh, Buddhism is not about rebirth. Although it's the one thing that the Buddha maintained that was popular belief at his time in northern India. Everything else he said, he didn't reject it. That's, that's a, a misconception that the Buddha rejected what people believed at that time. He just said, let's really look hard at it. Let's examine it. Let's see if this is really what's going on. But with karma and, and this whole notion of, of rebirth, he just said, yeah, okay, fine. Yep, this makes all the sense. And then he went and told many stories about former births. And of course, for literal Americans, this must mean that he had all of these former births. Now, if you were a Sufi, you would understand that the Buddha was telling stories to teach you something. Or if you were a Greek and your name was Aesop, you would be telling stories that teach children little moral lessons on how to live their lives. But of course, this was the Buddha, therefore everything has to be literal. Yeah, so everything that ever happened in previous lives was him remembering this stuff. That's all he did at night, was sit there and remember another <laughs> life so he could tell another story. And, and Buddhism, like the Sufis, is particularly in the school of Zen, we are a school of stories, and we use stories to approach the truth because the difficulty is that you can never quite say what it is. Like this whole business about enlightenment, you cannot talk about what enlightenment is. You can talk all around it. You can talk about what it is not. But to actually try to talk about what it is, besides being very silly, is pretty much impossible. Now, the closest I can ever come to talking about what it is, is to say that you have a change in the way you see things. And one way of, of, of saying that is that you, you turn 180 degrees. So people will say, well, you know, I had this experience. I had this experience last week. 
I had this experience when I was in school. I had this experience when I was 10 and I was laying on the grass looking down at the various leaves of grass. Remember when you do that kind of stuff? Of course, we're in the desert, so many of you maybe never actually looked at grass. <laughs> but you might have been looking at sand and looking at the different shapes of the sand. And you had this experience. And they'd say, was that an enlightenment experience? Well, I personally believe that people have enlightenment experiences. I talked with a fella mm, a couple of weeks ago. I'm trying to think I was gone last week. Who called me up, who's been watching these videos, so he'll probably see this video and then I'll get a phone call. He called me two days in a row and talked a long time, longer than Donna Post, and longer than Susan. <laughs> An extremely long time on the phone. I was losing my voice. I said, well, I guess we better stop talking now because I've had some issues with my voice lately. And he's told me something, and of course, I, I, uh, I don't really like talking on the phone. I, I personally, if we're going to talk about important stuff, I really like to see the person, okay? This, this business of talking on the phone is fine. I mean, we all know that I like to talk forever and ever. But he said, well, I think people have enlightenment experience all the time. Enlightenment experiences aren't that big a deal. And I don't even know what this guy looks like. You know, so I went, okay, because I don't know how to respond to that. Yeah, I can't hit him with a stick, you know, yeah. because he's on the other end of a phone. So I could scream into the phone and probably he would, you know, hang up and never call back. But I think people have enlightenment experiences. One writer years ago used to call them ahas, and they'd have these aha experiences. Having the experience isn't the issue. It's, does it change the way you see the world? If it does not change the way you see the world, then you, yes, you had an aha, but it just meant you solved a problem. Rob over here, he solves problems all the time. Him and I share that. We think about things. We wake up in the middle of the night. We get up in the morning. We're sitting there drinking our cup of coffee or whatever Rob drinks in the morning. He's, he's married to someone who eats very coffee. You let him have coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Drinking his coffee and kapoom, he figures out. I do that all the time. I don't think of it as an enlightenment experience, but I will think about something over and over and over again until I figure out how to do it. And then I go do it. When I was young, what I did is build a lot of really bad things and go, well, I won't do that again because that sucker is ready to fall down because that wasn't the smartest thing I ever did. But now I think about them and think about them and think about them. It's like these little altars. I'm so proud of these, the last thing I made. I thought about those until I was so sick and tired of those things, and then I did them. <laughs> and when I did them, I didn't have to think at all because I knew exactly what I was going to do. So, yeah, I think people have enlightenment experiences, but how does it affect the way they think? The day we were talking about this business of if you understand or you, you know part of the Lotus Sutra and uh, you, you carry that around in your head, then you don't have to do anything else. You don't have to feed monks. Just let them starve. Yeah. Now, for those of you that don't know in TV land, mm -hmm. monks don't normally work jobs. And normally the way they get food is somebody stops by the temple and brings a 50-pound bag of rice. And uh, like we have sitting down in our temple right now. And so uh, I, I went to my doctor and he said, you know, you shouldn't be eating so many carbohydrates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I got this 50-pound bag of rice. What am I going to do? So, you know, in the one sense, okay, what is that, was that, what was that sutra saying? It was saying you don't have to do all of these things to affect your rebirth. Now the question I ask you, why do you care? You see, this is a Zen temple. It's a Buddhist temple, but it's a Zen temple. So why do you care about your rebirth? What has your rebirth got to do with this moment? What does your rebirth have to do with the actions that you had yesterday and today and tomorrow? Are you going to be good because you're afraid of a bad rebirth? <laughs> That's like the, the worst reason in the world to be good. 
How about being good because being good is a good thing to do? Being good feels good. Helping other people feels good. It was brought up, the, the story of the raft. And in another sutra, not this sutra, but in the Pali Sutras, the Buddha talks about the raft. And the raft is this practice we have. And there are many different practices. There isn't one practice. There's a practice of paying attention to what you're doing all the time. There's a practice of being responsible for what you do and what you say. And realizing that you can come up with all kinds of rationalizations of why you did, but still when it's all done at the end of the day, it's your responsibility. That's practice. That's honesty. So in that sutra, the Buddha talks about the raft. And he talks about life as being a river. And we're going to cross this river. And we're going to get to the other side with this raft. And the raft, for the people that practice meditation, is primarily meditation. Meditation allows us to see our life as it is. Not as we want it to be, but simply as it is. And not only does it allow us to see it as it is, it allows us to accept it as it is. You know, I have to laugh every time another hundred self-help books come out. And I know they're all, I've read some of them. There's not a thing wrong with what they say. It's just they all say the same thing. Be nice to yourself. Be nice to other people. The world is a good place to live. Try smiling once in a while. It would be nice if you could help somebody else once in a while. They all say those kinds of things. So how many self-help books do you need on your shelf? Well, you could just put the Lotus Sutra up there and now you've, you've got a pretty good thing going. Or you could put the Sutra of the Sixth Patriarch. Or you could put the Shurangana Sutra. Or you could go out and buy some of the Pali Sutras. They all basically say the same thing. Remember the guy that wrote all the books that said, you're all right, I'm all right? Mm -hmm. I'm okay, you're I'm okay. okay. Are you okay? Uh, yeah, I'm okay, you're okay? Okay. Is that any different than what the Buddha said? Not one lick. I really think all these guys go to the library, get Buddhist literature, read it, and then write a self-help book. And then they go on a tour for three years all over America telling people how to be happy. And yet being happy is very simple. What do you have? Doesn't matter what do you have. That's what you have. Be happy with what you have. You want more? Well, as Vui Mung told someone that was here who was complaining that they didn't have much money, he said, go get another job. <laughs> That's pretty simple, isn't it? Yeah, go collect cans and turn them in for the money and get whatever it is you want. Okay, get moving. Do what you need to do. But don't sit and be unhappy because you don't have what you don't have. Because everybody has stuff they don't have. That's just the nature of things. Rob turned 60. I saw it in his eyes. He pretended it didn't matter. <laughs> Which is a good way to start. And then later on we can go, well, I guess it did matter, but now I'm here and so it's okay now. And then you can accept it when you turn 60. I thought something, I thought something weird was going to happen when I turned 50. Never paid attention to any birthday other than 50. I thought that I was really going to be different. <laughs> I kept waiting to change, and nothing happened. Because it just was 50. So the Buddha talked about this raft, and the raft is, for us, it's the meditation practice, or whatever practice we have, because there's many different practices. And one of the practices is to feed monks. We don't feed monks because we want a better birth. We have the absolute best birth we could possibly have right now. And if half of you disagree with me, that's all right, because half of you think that you have a lousy birth. Half of you think you had a lousy childhood. You know how many people have had a lousy childhood? I've done a survey on this. I've lived a long time. And I have discovered that about 99% of all the people I've ever met had a lousy childhood. Some of them were just, they weren't very loved. Some of them were, nobody liked them at school. 
Some of them were there was violence in their home. Some of them were mom was an alcoholic. Some of them were there was no dad. Okay. But really, most people didn't have that great a childhood. You don't get any control over this until you're about 18 years old. You pack a bag, like I did, and join the army. <laughs> and then you go, well, this isn't so bad. It's not mom's cooking, but it's not so bad. And then you move into being an adult. An adult realizes that nothing was ever perfect, except there were moments. Over and over there were moments, there were good moments. And once you get out on your own, you're responsible for your moments. If you don't like what's going on, change it. That may simply mean that you, get, you, you wash your laundry. <laughs> Maybe that's what you don't like going on. The house smells. I remember a friend telling me one time, she, she had this new boyfriend and she went over to his house and he was embarrassed because his house smelled. You know why his house smelled? He never washed his laundry. And she told me, she says, I went and washed his laundry because his feet stunk and all his, all his clothes stunk. And once you wash his laundry, all of a sudden the house smelled a lot better. Well, that's all we have to do is wash our laundry. We don't like what we're eating, eat something different. I got 50 pounds of rice, I'll let you get some <laughs> So here's this raft going across the river. And you know, I didn't think of it until now, but the Buddha never talked about a raft going across a lake. The Buddha always talked about a raft going across a river. Anybody ever been in a river? What's the first thing that happens? You got a current. So here you are trying to cross that river and that current's trying to push you this way. And you're just trying to get to the other side and you see a goal on the other side but it seems to keep slipping by you because of the current in the river. And so you get to the other side. And that means that you're awakened, whatever that means. Maybe it means that you're happy with your life. And you look back across the river and you go, well, that wasn't such a bad deal. It took a while to get here. You know, it took the Buddha seven years. Think about that. Here's this extraordinary guy, according to, according to traditionalists, he had thousands of rebirths, but then it took him seven years living in a forest, naked, almost starved to death to become awakened. But of course he lived tens of thousands of years to get to that point. It took Bodhidharma nine years to wake up. It took Dogen... Well, Dogen became a monk. How old was he, Mary? Was he 10, 12, something like that? Yeah, it took him over 20 years until he found a good teacher. So it takes a while. So now you're done, right? You don't need to meditate anymore. You don't need to feed monks. You don't need to build temples. And you look back across and you know what you see on that river? A bunch of other rafts. And somebody has to teach him how to get across. So you have a choice. And we like to say that this is the choice between the Mahayana and the Theravada. Now that's not really fair to the poor old Theravadans because it makes them sound like they're bad guys. And I've known enough of them that they're, they're busy helping people with their rafts. But we're very proud of the fact that we don't burn the raft when we get to the other side. We get back in the river throw out ropes, set examples on how to paddle against the current, do everything we can. And so the great teachers, you know, everybody loves the Dalai Lama. How can you not love this guy? All he does is smile and laugh, right? He is the most giggling monk I've ever seen. That's all he does. And yet every morning he gets up and he meditates. Now, why do you think he meditates? Because all of these Tibetans think he's a reincarnation of some kind of God. You know why he laughs all the time? Because he knows how silly that is. But he gets up every morning and he meditates and everybody in his community knows he meditates and so what do they do in the morning? They meditate. Does he need to meditate? Does it really matter? 
He needs to meditate for them. He needs to set the example. Now, I have to tell you the truth. If you're a real meditator, getting up in the morning when you're 80 years old, didn't he just turn 80? I think he did. He had a birthday. Or 100 or 90 or something. He got older. And you want to think in your head, well, when do I get to relax? Well, what's not relaxing about meditating? It's the perfect relaxation, right? The Buddha used to do meditation because he had bad arthritis. We know this. It's mentioned a number of times. And he would turn to Ananda and say, okay, I'm going to go sit for a while. And Ananda would give him the eye and he'd go, man, my arthritis is really bad today. And he would go into samadhi. And when he went into samadhi, it wasn't that the arthritis pain disappeared. It just didn't matter. Everything levels out. And so he set such a good example for us. He meditated right up until the end. And he said, you have to be a light to yourself. And he never said, I showed you how. He said, I gave you the Dharma. I gave you the teaching. That's I showed you how. He said, don't leave people behind in the road. Set a good example for them. So go ahead and feed monks. Go ahead and build temples. Go ahead and meditate so other people will meditate. But do you need to do it? You need to do it for somebody else. And this practice we have is not about us. This practice we have is about somebody else. <clears throat>